it's such a rewarding feeling to know that you're making your community literally healthier, physically and mentally healthier because of your work. This is Dr. Drew Ramsey. I'm your host. And as you all know, at heart, I'm also an Indiana Hoosier farm boy. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to have a, a true, incredible Indiana farmer here and a very special farmer. Ben Hartman grew up on a corn and soybean farm in Indiana. He graduated from college with degrees in English and philosophy. And then Ben and his wife, Rachel Hirschberger, they own and operate a, a very cool farm. It's called Clay Bottom Farm. And if you're from Indiana, you get that joke because, boy, we got a, we've got a lot of land, especially where I'm from in southern Indiana, that it's just it's like six inches of topsoil, then it's clay. You can't grow stuff in clay. Clay Bottom Farm is in Goshen, Indiana. They have been making their living growing and selling specialty crops. And uh, Ben and his wife, Rachel, they, Clay Bottom Farm is one of my favorite Instagrams because the amount of food that they produce, uh, and they are on less than one acre. And so they are real experts in, in what's called micro farming. The farm has twice won the Edible Michiana's Reader's Choice Award. And the Lean Farm was Ben's first book. It won the Shingo Institute's prestigious publication award. Uh, in 2017, Ben was named one of Gris 50 emerging green leaders in the United States. Uh, and Clay Bottom Farm also have an amazing online course for any of you like me who, you know, have a farm and kind of wonder what to do with it. Ben is just a wonderful inspiration and in what he, he and Rachel have done with their family. I think it's such a, in some ways, prototype for what people hope to do when they go back to the land, uh, when they want to have their land be efficient and productive. So we will put lots of links in the resources, but today we have the pleasure of having Ben with us. Ben, thank you. I'm such a huge fan of yours. I'm, as I said, when we got on, I'm fangirling a little bit here. Because it, it, tell us a little bit about where you are right now, all on your farm, and uh, how things are going for you. Well, Drew, thank you very much uh, for having having uh, me on the podcast. Um, I have to say first that eat to be, eat to beat depression and anxiety has been uh, almost a biblical book in our house, <laughs> and we referred to it. We've referred to it for uh, since it came out, and there are so many overlaps between your work and what we're doing. Uh, here, it seems like the Venn diagram wouldn't overlap too much, but there really is so much overlap. I'm really excited to have out this conversation here. Well, Ben, th thank you so much. It means so much to me to know that, that Eat to Beach Depression is in your home, and certainly uh, it's great to connect now. I've spent a lot of days on my farm or time sitting on my tractor just knowing I'm not quite doing it right and wishing <laughs> wishing I could give you a call. So, uh, and, and before we get too far, everyone, please hold up. You've got a new amazing book coming out, uh, uh, The your first book, The Lean Farm. It might surprise people what that was about. We'll get into Ben's philosophy of farming, but Lean Micro Farm is kind of for all of us who garden or maybe farm at home. Yeah, The Lean Micro Farm uh, book coming out uh, next month is taking the idea that a small space doesn't have to be inefficient. Small space can be very productive. And so it's really written for people who want to farm on a part-time basis or maybe serious backyard gardeners. There's a specific plan in the book to raise $20,000 from a backyard. So people who want to do this as a summer project, part-time, uh, anyone, I think anyone uh, who can uh, put a seed in the ground can call themselves a farmer. And this book is for them. Ben, we'll, we'll put some links in. And, and part of what you're talking about is efficiency. Because a lot of times when people think about farms, they think about the farms that you grew up on, corn and soy farm. That's what Indiana is known for. The, the northern part of Indiana uh, is very flat, and a lot of it has very deep, rich topsoil. And there is a, a, a lot of big corn and soy farms. This is the type of farm you grew up on. That's right. I grew up on a 500 acre corn soybean farm. And uh, growing up, I in, uh, what kid doesn't enjoy you know, riding in tractors, driving tractors, and learning how big machines work? However, I had a hunch uh, fairly early on that I wanted to farm, but not on a giant scale. And also, to, the, I, I, to zoom out a bit, the, the landscape in agriculture, that at this point, there just really are not opportunities. <laughs> Uh, unless you inherit thousands and thousands of acres to to start a farm, you really have to be small, smart, shrewd, uh, be a micro farmer with a different mindset. Um, uh, between 2011 and 2018, uh, in the U.S. alone, we lost more than a thousand farms a month. 
Uh, the rate of bankruptcy is 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 worrisome. Uh, suicide rates among farmers are among the highest of any profession. Uh, the University of Colorado had a study uh, come out this summer that uh, said says that at the tra- if we if we remain on the trajectory the current trajectory uh, by the end of this century we'll have half as many farmers as we have now. Okay, and the farms that do remain will be twice as big as they are. And my kids enjoy playing uh, the board game Monopoly uh, right now. <laughs> uh, but to be in agriculture is like being in the last two or three rounds of Monopoly where the rapid consolidation is happening. <laughs> and there are just fewer and fewer farmers uh, every year, every month, actually, and uh, which is a sad, re- sad reality because it's a beautiful career. It's the world's best way to make a living, in my humble op- opinion. I wouldn't want to be doing anything else. And I want more, as well, I want as many people... Uh, as possible to get into the profession. And if not full-time, at least to put a seed in the back in their backyard and grow food for their mental health. The, I think that's where you and I certainly are uh, united as brothers in this notion that uh, growing stuff is so good for the soul and for the spirit and for the health of us, of our communities. Uh, what do you understand about farming or how does it hit you and kind of hit you in your core in a way that maybe is different? Because so often... When people think about farming, they don't think about it as the best career. And they think about it as arduous, as risky. How are you seeing it differently and experiencing it differently, do you think? That it's it like lights you up? Well, we have in this country almost created a culture in which physical work is considered an abomination and only uh, uh, only fit for low-paid persons to do. And the reality is working with your hands in soil with plants is one of the most health giving activities that you can do. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with his um, blue zone study, uh, the idea that there are pockets around the world where people live longer than in other places. And the one common uh, aspect that's pr- perhaps underappreciated about all this blue zone study is that every single one of the blue zones and persons in that blue zone has a garden. Uh, these are people growing their own food because it's physically uh, one of the best things you can do for your body. You're in, different positions, um, uh, moving, you're getting your steps in. Um, but I'm a big believer in this biophilia concept. The idea, uh, EO Wilson, I think coined that term, but the idea, uh, that we're drawn to be in, in a part of nature. And when we extract ourselves from, from nature, uh, that's when problems start to creep in. And so to, to just have a garden, even five plants, uh, a couple of tomatoes, a couple of heads of lettuce, grow some spinach in the winter. It doesn't take much. And uh, it, 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 I've seen it happen over and over again. It really balances a person. Ben, will you tell us a little bit of your suspected mental health benefits? I appreciate the physical benefits. And, and I, I completely agree as someone who grew up on a farm. And for a little bit of my career, I was commuting between Manhattan, where I'd, I'd sit in, my, in, in this chair, I'd sit in that chair, and uh, in my suit and see patients. And then I'd fly back to the farm in really rural Indiana, down opposite end of the state from you, down in southern Indiana, where it's hilly and there's even less topsoil. And, uh, and I'd work the farm and see some patients by video. And I was always struck. I'd get all cut up. I'd be sore. I'd sleep like just a log. But it was such a different existence. And, and, and so I really appreciate the, the, that uh, way that physical labor and also physical labor on a farm, which is different than working out in a gym, right? It's, it's just so, uh, mm-hmm. and it mm-hmm. engages the mind and the mind-body connection in such a different way. But I'm curious what you think the mental health benefits are of being a farmer. Because, you, you know, the suicide rate is horrible. It's actually number one. Physicians and farmers tie. They argue which one, but but both of them pretty much are the, the number one uh, occupations for suicide risk. And especially right now, as you noted, with this consolidation and loss of farms and disrespect of farming. So I'm, I'm wondering, if you, what, what if you do it right are the mental health benefits of being a farmer? Well, to be a large-scale farmer means you're heavy, heavily leveraged. Uh, you have a lot of capital, a lot of skin in the game, and there's very, there are very thin margins. And when those margins uh, dissipate, disappear, uh, then it is very, you're in a very stressful position. Uh, what, what I try to, what I advocate for is starting out small, starting at a micro scale. I call it the four-two approach in my book, where I choose four crops, 
choose two, two accounts, two customers, maybe a restaurant and a farmer's market. Uh, start from there. It's easier to grow from a small place, uh, less stressful certainly, than to start at a giant scale and try to winnow, pare down from there. Ben, do you, um, do you have any farms you might be able to point to in your window that are a good example of uh, starting well, a couple of crops? At this point, we are actually on a, we're growing on one third of an acre. And that's, this is not a screen grab, but this is our farm uh, in the window here. So you're looking at uh, productivity on a small scale. Uh, it's really a myth that, uh, that you have to keep getting bigger and doing more every year to, to be productive. You can actually do less every year. Uh, is that what you your productivity? that is a part of the mental health secret, that there's a myth of efficiency and, and, and scaling uh, that, that, that getting bigger and getting more efficient is where all the profit and the margin is. And, and that's actually just not true about farming. And, and, and it's part of why you have mental health around farming that you have, you've shrunk it down to something that is I don't know, family sized in a certain way. The Tao Te Ching says something uh, to the effect of live close to the ground, gr excuse me, live close to the gr ground, keep your thoughts simple. And that's sort of our philosophy of, of farming. Let's keep a simple production system. Um, let's not complicate things. And uh, it's, it's worked economically and it's made for a much more sane place to, to work. Uh, at this point, our food sells within a mile and a half. Most, almost all of our food sells within a mile and a half of our farm. How many families or how many people would you say you're, you're, you're feeding in, in a year? Well, most of it's going to restaurants. A couple, we're the back-end farm for a couple of restaurants here in Goshen, Indiana. And Goshen is a small college town. There's a small Mennonite college here. And this isn't uh, Chicago or Los Angeles. <laughs> but we're able to support ourselves because of the close ties we have in our community. And we let the community lead. Uh, one, we use the lean system on our farm, but one of the truisms of lean is you start with the customer, work backwards from there. And so to really deeply listen to our customers, we use this process in, in lean, the Japanese term would be Genshi Genbutsu, and which roughly translates to up close and personal listening to thoroughly understand a situation. Mm. And so if you're that a farmer- like mental health. Well, <laughs> could perhaps. <laughs> And so if you're a farmer selling to restaurants, this means you have a long, slow meal in the restaurant with a chef every winter. And I do that. We, I sit down with chefs and we have a conversation about what's their vision for the next year? Uh, what's on the menu? What changes might they anticipate? And then that chef and I almost sort of co-create our businesses together. Uh, he certainly helps me design the farm, choose seeds uh, and, and I, I, the amounts. And uh, I give him... Um, menu ideas based on seasonal products that we might be able to produce. And it's a way that, and well, in lean, they would call that a pull system uh, as a business concept instead of a push system. Push system would be where we would open a seed catalog and order whatever varieties we want, put them in the ground, and after they're produced, try to push them out onto the community. And this is how most small businesses start. Pro uh, entrepreneurs enthusiastic about a product or a process, and they create the product and then as an afterthought almost, uh, go out and try to find customers. But here we're, we're letting the customer co-create the farm in a sense. It must be so exciting when you bring those, um, you know, whether it's a special daikon radish that you guys have schemed about or whether uh, you and, and some of your friends, maybe one of them, she's, you know, wanted a black tomato varietal and you've put a few plants in the ground. It must be, can you share a little bit what it's like when you kind of put that box in the truck and, and uh, head to the restaurant and, and, and kind of do the unveiling with the chef? Well, like I said, there's no better career in the world. And the big part of that reason is because uh, it's such a rewarding feeling to know that you're making your community literally healthier, physically and mentally healthier because of your work. And very few people can have that level of confidence that what they're doing is, is actually lowering the cancer rate in Goshen. Uh, and, you know, uh, making, uh, giving literal, literal energy to kids going to school. And that's just a wonderful feeling. And, um, and to know that the community appreciates it enough to make it possible for us to do what we love to do for, for a living. Um, and the, I, I think it's, there's almost a, uh, well, there's a Buddhist concept called right livelihood. <laughs> and part of the idea 
here is that you're either contributing to the health of your community through your work or, or the opposite. You're contributing to conditions that cause disease. And it's important uh, to, to in, from that point of view, to analyze your work and to steer towards health. And when you steer towards a product that is healthy and producing it in ways that are healthy for the environment uh, and for the com community, there's a benefit to you too. It's not just to your, for, for your community. Ben, you've just transformed the foodscape of uh, the Goshen community. When we think about places where there's amazing farm to table food, you know, Goshen College, Goshen, Indiana doesn't spring to people's mind. As you said, we think about the coasts. And one of, part of my experience living in the Midwest uh, after living on the coast was, uh, uh, I would say, a, a misunderstanding or maybe a, a, a misperception, maybe it's no perception of the real farm focused revolution that was happening in middle America. That, you know, as we went from, I don't know, a thousand farmers markets in America in the early 2000s to, I think, by last count, almost 10,000, I'm sure more than 10,000 now, although I'm, the pandemic, I'm sure, affected that number. There is just this resurgence and people being interested in where the food came from, people wanting to come to farms like yours, and then little small restaurants. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. There's a perception that it's the East Coast, the ideas begin in the East Coast and West Coast, and they they finally filter down to us bumpkins here in the mid, Midwest. And when it comes to food systems, the most radical uh, ideas and uh, alternative economies for local micro scale food systems are here in the mid Midwest and perhaps they'll filter out to the coast eventually. But the largest small farm conference in the U S right now is in La Crosse, Wisconsin, uh, of all places. It's not in Los Angeles. There are just a lot of energy, a lot of creativity, uh, here. And in part, I think it's because we're surrounded by the, the gigantic agriculture. We see that rapid consolidation happening around us. It's a very visceral change in the economy. My own, you know, you know, my own family farm is uh, in undergoing that center change right now. So it's very, it's very visceral and, and we're saying enough is enough. Uh, and that, that style of giant scale food production uh, is making it, it's, 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 it's literally making us sick. Uh, childhood diabetes never been higher. Uh, you name it, the, the, the current food system contributes to the disease in this country and it's time for an alternative. And, and there are farmers who, who have that mindset and eaters too. And we're working together to make that happen. Yeah, it's exciting to, to see it happening really in the center of the obesity and diabetes epidemics in a certain way. The Ohio River Valley, the Mississippi River Valleys, uh, you know, it's called the Sun Belt at times, but just a, a, a way that lifestyle diseases uh, are leading the way. And, and since we're talking about mental health and mental fitness, I really love this notion of a revolution of what, what happens if it changes and uh, the farmers, the future farmers, uh, the eaters who hear this decide to make a revolution in their own personal habits of how they eat uh, and start eating more food grown by folks like you. I think maybe part of the mental health secret that you've got going, Ben, is that, you, unlike the farmers with the big commodities, you get to really see the effect of what you grow and you get to see it light somebody up, whether it's a chef that you've grown something for or whether it's people in the restaurant or whether it's just that that restaurant is continuing to get amazing uh, growth and customers and reviews because its food is just as good as you can find. And that's, that's just such a, that's just a cool fountain of mental health for you. Mm -hmm. I think so too. I, I see it as, uh, as, as mental health in three parts <laughs> uh, when it comes to food. First of all, there's the, the act of growing the food, as I've talked about, the physical tangible act of growing it. And then there's the nutrition you get from eating the food, of course, the minerals that the food provides. And your book is an excellent encyclopedia, encyclopedia of information on that. And then there's the community part, sharing the food with the community. And all three parts come together on a micro farm where you're hyper localized, selling the food to people who you know. We can put it, we, we, we can name uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of our customers by name, and they know us to have that relationship at a time uh, culturally when isolation is a problem, a growing problem, and loneliness. Uh, food is the, the best thread I know of to weave communities back together. 
it helped me a lot when I moved to New York and I was maybe having some mental health challenges as a you know young man, new doctor, uh, uh, wasn't quite yet a dad. I, I rediscovered farmers markets, and so I think you know sometimes when people think about farms and farmers markets, they don't realize they're all all around us. You know whether you're in Los Angeles or New York City or uh, uh, you know even Indianapolis, Indiana. And and so this idea that Ben has of working on your mental health and mental fitness personally uh, by, uh, as we've heard in another episode, uh, Tanmit Seti uh, uh, talked about growing your circle. And, and one of the parts of your circle that I think everyone listening should really consider and, and actualize is knowing some of the people who grow some of your food. The Ben isn't going to grow all of my calories, but I guarantee you I'm going to eat some meals grown by Ben in my lifetime. And if I lived near Goetian, I I would be eating a lot. I would, I would be kind of keeping track. What percentage, out of a little challenge, what percentage of my uh, caloric intake could come from Ben's farm? How much? And and so I, I challenge everybody to really, you know, maybe you don't know a farmer. Great. You can go to a farmer's market this weekend, shake a hand. Buy something, you know, ask them their favorite vegetable, buy something that's in season. I've been, I've had a number of patients in New York. I've been a little scared of farmers and farmers markets. Not big scared, just a little like a little hesitant that, that they didn't know quite what to do. And, and I've always wondered about that and shared with them my sense is that you're a farmer's favorite person because you're the person who's going to buy and eat their food, that, that they're the whole reason the farmer is farming. But so I wonder if you had a few words for anyone who's either a little farmer's market hesitant or, or you know, people who are going to farmer's markets, a lot of um, ways for us to approach it better from your standpoint. Well, one of my favorite farmer's market quotes, uh, Neil Young uh, said, uh, never drive past, never drive by a farmer's market, go in and support humanity. And I think that part of what he means there is that this, this is not just economics, this is about this is a social social experiment going on here. You're buying food, but you're also building relationships. There's no reason to shy away from a farmers market because, as you say, farmers want people in the door. We want we want people up to our booths, and uh, you'd be surprised at uh, at how extroverted some farmers can be. And it's it's and and I think an important piece of this is that it's fun. Uh, shopping at uh, big box stores for me, at least, isn't fun. Maybe it is for some people. Uh, but you're bound to have a good time at your local farmer's market. Are there um, vegetable tips you have for us as eaters? My favorite vegetable is spinach. And uh, we're, at, we're in uh, going into winter uh, here, and it's not too late to plant spinach. Spinach is queen of the cold. When other crops, uh, actually just this morning, we were ripping out tomato crops from the greenhouse. And this afternoon, after this interview, I'll go out and plant spinach. And so when the, the kings of summer uh, have done their duty, uh, the queen of winter comes in in spinach, and spinach loves the backside of the calendar. Uh, seed it um, while you still have some days here before Thanksgiving days get too short to get, get, get good germination, good start. And then spinach uh, loves, it thrives in the cold. And even if you don't have a hoop house, you can grow it in your backyard uh, on the south side of your house if you have room, a little sun pocket. Um, and, uh, if not, that's fine too. It'll grow in the North and you can use uh, a cloth. If you have single, single digit nights, you know, super cold nights, you might want to protect it with an old blanket or something. Uh, but for the most part, it will survive the winter. It's, uh, we've had it survive, uh, uncovered on the South side of our house, uh, uh, many winters. And do we know why spinach I, is so tough? Do we know why it's so tough? Part of the reason nutritionally is that this is a heavy feeding green. Most greens are light feeders. Okay, your lettuces, uh, arugula, uh, and what I mean by that is they 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 pull relatively few minerals from the soil. S spinach will pull, and from my own uh, experience, I can tell you, spinach will pull as many minerals, minerals from the soil as a twenty foot tall tomato plant. A tiny spinach, so it's packing the, the nutrients in, and uh, that's one of the reasons it's it's on my short list of crops. Uh, for nutritional psychiatry, <laughs> for mental health, that it needs to be on that list because I know from a farmer's point of view that it's pulled uh, lots of minerals from the soil because I have to replace those minerals before planting the next crop. And those minerals go directly into your mouth and into your digestive system and, and improve your mental health. 
Ben, I, I love this. I want to hear this whole list. Farmer Ben Hartman's top uh, foods uh, for nutritional psychiatry. I think spinach is a really great one because I don't think it's one that I I use enough or include enough. Um, and I don't think that's just been my kale habit. I mean, even in my own greenhouse right now, I, you know, I've got a lot of unruly tomato plants. I was embarrassed I was going to do the podcast from the greenhouse. I worried about my Wi-Fi reception. And then I realized it's not the Wi-Fi I'm worried about. I'm worried about these unruly tomato plants. I've just let them go on feral. Ben's not going to – this is not efficient. It's more <laughs> It's more of like uh, of a shrine, I would say, than uh -huh. uh, you know a productive greenhouse at this point. Um, but putting in some spinach, it sounds like, would be a really good idea. It's, it's a way to two-time your garden. You can uh, easily double crop a garden uh, and grow all, all year, all four seasons, uh, by using spinach as your, your late fall and winter and early spring crop. Ben, I do want to hear your top vegetables for well, nutrition. Well, okay, so you, I, it, I, I think it's important to have the greens, and that's kind of classic, and everyone knows that. You have to... Which you, ones do you, you like? Spinach? Your what smoothie? are your favorites? Well, we have a green smoothie every morning, and it consists of the greens that you see behind me here. Uh, there's, I'll move my, you can see in the corner, we have a kale, full size kale that's about um, a shoulder height at this point. Man, your kale, your kale is so beautiful, Ben. I mean, it's really, it's some of the prettiest kale, especially because. Your Ben's soil is really special in the sense he's really been working it, cultivating it, really reducing weed pressure through this lean farming system where instead of using pesticides or chemicals, he just uses really, really smart management and kind of engineering to make sure there aren't lots of seeds of uh, all kinds of uh, you know, weeds in the soil. For home gardeners, my best tip is leaves. Leaves are golden. And I'll be completely honest, we, have not, we do not truck in fertilizer here. The, the fertility source is, is leaves from within a mile and a half of Goshen. And the city thankfully drops them off at no cost to us. I turn them two or three times, put four inches of that compost on the soil surface here. And that's what we grow into is, is composted leaves. And you can see, leaves are from trees, of course, and trees are sucking minerals from deep within the earth, and depositing them into their canopy. And then those leaves fall to the earth and, re, and, and, and supply minerals to the top layers of the earth. So this is nature's way of growing food. And what we're, we've done is just mimicked what's going on in the woods behind us uh, on our farm. And it's made for easier farming, lower cost farming, and more nutritious food. I want you to keep walking us through your day as an eater. You got a big green smoothie with all kinds of, of uh, greens in there. Some kale. What other greens do you have behind you there that you put in the smoothie? Okay, so some of our favorites in our fa family are uh, high fiber. What I call high fiber gr greens, because so I, I, we like greens and we like the fiber crops for your for your gut health. So we eat lots of carrots. Uh, you can see a, an entire bed of carrots. My pointer pointing out here. That's just for our family here. We eat an enormous amount of carrots. We have two kids, ages seven and nine, and we can't stomach uh, store-bought carrots anymore. We're snooty <laughs> about our carrots. What's the difference between a, a farmer, a clay bottom farm carrot and a store-bought carrot? Well, what happens is that as the weather gets colder, the starches turn into sugars on, on almost all vegetables, but especially with carrots. And so if you want a sweet, true carrot taste, it has to be a late fall growing carrot. And these carrots coming from California and Mexico are summer growing carrots. They, 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 they haven't gone through that vernalization, that cold, that cold process that, that, uh, can, that, that literally changed, chemically changes the carrot. So we're, in my opinion, eating a completely different vegetable than what appears in the grocery store. That's also, I think there's that, um, it, it, I wouldn't call it dirt. There's an earthiness where that outer layer, it's not that you're, you know, it got dirt, but there's the outer layer that's not quite as kind of polished and clean in a real farm carrot. Where you get a little earthiness in there that, that I, is just so great. And then the smell of those carrot greens when you pull them out. Oh, mm. boy. Mm. I mean, those are, I, I think there's a carrot top or a carrot top green pesto I, I heard about a that's rumor right. of somewhere. Yeah. You so. can cook it in soup and do all kinds of things with it. Mm -hmm. So carrots are one. Turnips, uh, there's a Japanese turnip called a Hakurai turnip. Uh, H A K A, uh, Hakurai turnip. So look that up online. You can buy seeds. It's a fast turnip. It'll uh, go from seed to harvest in less than two months. And it is the, the sweetest uh, thing you've ever had. 
Uh, they're perfectly round and white. Uh, they can grow to the size of a baseball, baseball, and they're just so juicy. How do you cook them up, Ben? We, well, the beautiful thing is these are not bread to be cooked. These are fresh-eating turnips. You slice them like a radish, and they're three times as sweet as a radish. And, and um, uh, it's almost a candy, to be honest. Uh, and our kids will get home. Well, I'll tell you what happens. Our kids come home from school. school oh, they head to the greenhouse to the figs. Because they're gonna they're gonna pluck the first ripe figs off those trees. You can't you can't uh, avoid avoid that happening. And then they'll head out to the Hakurai turnips and start munching on them. They'll pick them up. They'll eat them like apples. Do you do you and Rachel just sit on the porch and hold hands and watch this happen and and really feel like you know we did it? Like the kids come home, they eat figs, they eat turnips. I mean that's just. I think every parent's dream. I'm, I'm idealizing our life a bit. Not every day is like that. Well, but, uh, okay, not every you know, but. Do, the fact you put up some numbers that some days are like that, I think everybody listening, you know, has has a little bit of a, uh, you know, pines for that. Are the as as we battle the various things that kids tend to come home and eat. It sounds like part of um, your farm wisdom and farm knowledge that translates really to a lot of mental health and mental fitness, and that kind of fundamental role of eating more plants. And 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 one of the real challenges that most people have. And I think I think the turnip uh, it's a hakari turnip. Uh, Hak- yeah, hakari turnip. It's a, it's a good example. Yeah. Something that just you're not going to get at your grocery store. You're going to find from a farmer. Uh, ben, can I ask you? Have a lot of Japanese influence. You uh, Buddhist influence. You're a philosophy major. Can you, can you share a little bit as an Indiana farm boy? You know, there's such a, I mean, we're both white Indiana farm boys. I think there's a lot of, mm-hmm. uh, let's say, ideas and biases about who we are and sensitive, mm-hmm. thoughtful creatures thinking about philosophy and mental health and spirituality. That's not often the stereotype or the trope of what we are. And I'm really curious how, how you got interested and inspired by so many other cultures. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say that most of it was through the teachers that I had. I went to Mennonite High School um, here in Goshen, went to the Mennonite College here in Goshen and had teachers with expansive perspectives and views on the world and uh, who assigned some great books uh, and ancient, spent a lot of time mired in ancient wisdom (laughs) Um, growing up. And that was important. If you, uh, a predominance, what you hear on Sunday mornings out in where I grew up, which is Amish country, uh, you don't see cars and you walk or bike down the road and you hear in unison an Amish church singing hymns uh, that sometimes are over 400 years old. And these are hymns that have been passed down from one generation to the next. And the it, Amish would be an Anabaptist group and there was persecution that happened during the Reformation. And these were hymns that uh, that were created as songs in prison. Uh, to 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 help that community, their mental health, uh, through that that difficult time, and that ancient wisdom uh, has been passed on just through. Gen- so it's just thick. The culture is really thick around here in a way that it simply isn't in a lot of places. And I think that uh, it's important to eat fresh local food, but it's important to interrupt the minute by minute, you know, news cycle, your fa- interrupt your Facebook feed with ancient wisdom uh, too. And there is that culture here that's, that simply doesn't exist in, in, many, in many other places. There was a really wonderful um, David Brooks piece. Uh, and I'm not a, 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 the biggest of essay readers, um, but it was talking about how we have become mean as a culture. And, it, and the piece spoke a lot about institutions and how they're fragile. And I, I've kind of, I would say wondered a lot in my own life of, of mm. how to be best related to institutions. But I think what you're speaking about with a, a deep roots of a community is one of the ways that you have accentuated and kept mental health as a farmer. Mm-hmm. And people ask us, well, why are we, why are we still in Indiana? Uh, there's a brain drain happening here, of course, like many, many rural places, but, we're just too deeply, deeply rooted here. It's the same reason I don't pull up my fig plants. <laughs> I, I just can't imagine the world without those roots in the ground. Yeah, I mean, there's no other place that you belong. And I think that there's a groundedness there that uh, many people don't experience. 
I mean, I think it's something that is, is very foreign as, as people have uh, moved more, as there has been, uh, as you say, a brain drain and a, a, a person drain from the Midwest and the rural Midwest. Um, and we're very grateful, ha- having gone to a small Indiana, I went to Earlham, which is a Quaker school. Um, and so there are these small, really wonderful institutions, mind-expanding institutions, you say, that, that uh, help – uh, anchor these communities and and uh it's really wonderful so, hearing about sure. there's a need i think a, a need in the country right now for uh old knowledge about how to stitch communities together uh we've talked about the loneliness epidemic uh rampant individualism but we there's a need for old knowledge about how to how to form a community and food is right at the center of it for the, for the Mennonites, uh, potlucks and <laughs> sharing food, barn raising. Um, we have a cook, Mennonite cookbook that includes instructions for how to feed a, when a barn raising feed feed people when a barn raising happening. And it's like a barn like a barn raising menu. Like find find a hundred men. Like uh, they like literally telling you to put fifty eggs into a bowl and whip them up and uh, put five gallons of wheat into it and make some muffins. Uh, that sc- that scale of community cooking, <laughs> um, that knowledge still exists around here in a way that, and, and not just in restaurants. We're talking, you know, and at, at a home at, at home. Can you share a little bit of what that feeling is like when, when you go to a, a Mennonite event, a community event, where people are eating your food that you've grown, but also you're taking part in something that is, you know, is, is hundreds of years old that's been rooted and also rooted there in that part of Indiana for hundreds of years. Sure. We grow carrots. Um, we grow a bed of carrots for the school that our kids go to. It's uh, a Mennonite elementary uh, school. And it's important not just for nutrition that they have those carrots, I think, but some, and, and the school kids come out to our farm. Uh, we give tours here and they see where those carrots are grown and the kids help harvest and wash those carrots. So it's important to teach uh, those skills. <laughs> Uh, how do you grow a carrot? And so that by the time that tour is over, I want kids to know that if they wanted to grow their own carrots in the backyard, and these are second, third, fourth graders, we're not talking about high schoolers, but even at that age, um, to start teaching those skills to another generation um, so that we keep these varieties that have been in the Mennonite, rhubarb would be one. There's a Mennonite mint. There there are varieties and there are foods that are just uh, part of the culture that uh, make life interesting that I'd spice and flavor to life and that I don't want to be lost in the next generation. Oh, I also love how they, they, they mean something to you varietals that have been among your people or in your uh, area. I think varietals are one of those things that big box agriculture and stores um, don't have capacity for. I was always a, uh, I was struck. I, I went on a big kale tour back in the kale days, and I was in the largest kale field in America. It was all lacinato. And it was uh, filled with purslane as well. You know, the purslane has mm-hmm. more omega 3s than, than kale. You know, purslane is really interesting, uh-huh. right? Purslane salad's mm-hmm. great. It's uh, this, you know, wild succulent, succulent that's edible. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's not what was getting harvested, right? It was just getting you know, left and laid to waste. And it was, um, I think when people can, and I hope everyone will check out the Clay Bottom Farm Instagram and and check out Ben's book and his course, you you see on these small farms, there's just an incredible diversity. There's much more use of hand tools. I think one of the fascinating parts of, of your work is how much you do by hand. And, and again, that, that isn't, um, can, can you speak just a little bit about how physical movement and physical labor is like one, I, I guess one question is, I wonder how non, what advice do you have for non-farmers to get more physicality into our lives? Yeah. And maybe to help answer that, I could share a bit about my personal mental health and how farming has been important to the, a, a number of years I was a stutterer. And I had, um, still do have what's called, called spasmodic dysphonia. And this is where the vocal cords will collapse sort of involuntarily. And I found that there were two times, when, and, and it was to the point where, I remember when the Lean Farm book came out and the, the first uh, uh, interview I had to give for that book, I could barely get a word out. I was so nervous and... Uh, I just stuttered my way through it. And I thought this interview, there's, a, there's 10 words in here that they're going to be able to piece together for their article. And 
but I found that over the years there, there, there are two times and places uh, where I have, uh, where that's not a concern, uh, vocal production. And one is when I'm with um, Mennonite singing hymns <laughs> and singing among other people with specs. My this phone, will tell you uh, singing somehow lubricates the vocal cords and, and disrupts the, the, the pathways, the neural pathways that, um, and stutter, stutters will say that too. They don't have those, those blocks and repetitions when they're singing. And second, it's when I'm with plants. And immediately after that interview, I went out and got physical with plants. I did something like, you know, rip out kale or tomatoes and, uh, and just, uh, it, it, within minutes, it was able to center myself and get back to the baseline that I knew was my real self. And so it's been a, a journey, uh, certainly. And it's in, it involves more than just music and, and, uh, growing plants. Um, uh, I've worked with, you know, some psychiatry, some, some, uh, psychologists too. Um, but without food and plants, I can't imagine, um, how I would find a baseline, uh, every morning and, uh, and stay focused and present. Ben, thank you so much for sharing all of that. I think it's so inspirational to anybody who's, you know, struggling with something that that uh, like a stutter, you know, where there's something neurological that is just so, um, you know, uh, frustrating and and um, and needs to be dealt with in a certain way. And then I just really I think makes me. Um, you know, just appreciate this interview more and also uh, the strength and the bravery to launch a book and um, all the work that you've done to, you know, have, have fluency and, and uh, transcend the moments that you don't. And I love the notion about the plants. I feel that too. I don't know what it is. One of the first things when we moved to Wyoming really bothered me because we were moving from our family farm where I've been, you know, building beds and growing stuff and, you know, you're, you've got your various perennials in, you know, Kind of watching every season how they do, and uh, and one of the first things we put in was a, a little greenhouse, so just sort of the shedding roof that you know doesn't get the best light, but got some. And and I find a lot of times I just go out there. Uh, I'm not very. I wouldn't even say it's mm-hmm. about a lot of productivity. I feel a little guilty, Ben, that I know I could be growing a lot more food if I was like as good as you, but I, I feel it's a little bit more like I said, like a shrine where I just kind of. Right. I like to go out there sometimes and sit and uh, and it's interesting how the, the plants feel a little bit like they have personalities or a little consciousness, like I'm swimming in a school of fish kind of. Mm-hmm. I think adults can touch that feeling easily and especially kids. Uh, we have two hammocks that hang in our greenhouse and so it's important, I think, to to just hang out with plants, not always uh, quote unquote work with with them. Um, well, our kids love to go out there in the winter, just, just hang out with plants in the, in the, in the hammocks. What, what do you think the kids are picking up on that us adults need a little lubrication, a little help finding? <laughs> well, they gravitate towards it. And, uh, when they get home from school, for instance, uh, like you said, they'll get their figs, they'll get their turnips, <laughs> then they'll hit the hammocks and it, it was, it's just uh, paradise around here, isn't it? But, um, uh, that, uh, that, uh, I, they gravitate towards it and, I think it is part of uh, their memory too. Uh, it, when the we have the kids each have their own garden, and uh, they get to choose what goes in the garden, uh, where it's planted, when it's planted. That's their space. And uh, our oldest son Arlo, he is uh, ecstatic when the sunflowers come up every year, and they self seed <laughs> for the most part. And um, uh, he's fastidious about saving each of those seeds that comes up because, and this is a friend of his that's come back to revisit him for another season of his, of his life. He takes the relationship with the plant more seriously. Well, I think so. And if, uh, I or Rachel or someone else were to trammel his garden and to uproot, uh, that those, some of those sunflowers, it would be a relationship that's torn from him. And so it's a beautiful thing to see a child develop relationships with nature. You know, Ben, that's very helpful. I hadn't really thought about it that way. That's really helpful to me, especially uh, when I think about things that my mother has given to me, I would say that that one is a very, you know, the plants have names, right? Like if, if she's one of those folks, like if you, you know, you, you, you cut off a branch of one of her plants, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of like you've wounded, you know what? I think other people come almost the equivalent to an animal, you mm-hmm. know, it just like really would offend her, you know, like, whoa. 
Like, what do you mean you you weren't paying attention and you like ripped off that big branch of the <laughs> you know this or that house plant? So uh, I think there's something where people maybe don't you know we think a lot about eating more plants, but p- people don't think uh, about the simpler maybe more mental fitness oriented about a uh, uh, phrase, which would just be more plants, not just eating them, growing them, sitting around them. I'm, I'm sort of weird. I like to like get in there and like nuzzle them. Like well, I've got a, I don't have much in the greenhouse right now, but I've got one fennel pl- bulb, one fennel, but it's come, uh, it's flowering. And so there's something about the, uh, the, this big, I don't know, like fennel seed flower that I find very, um, uh, uh, like fun to put your face in. And, and, and then there's all the aromatics, I guess, that we still have, the, the, you know, the crushing up a little basil or, um, when I go into the greenhouse, I crush up the, uh, the tomato plant a little bit and you just get that, all those kind of memories and associations. So, Mm -hmm. Yeah. We are trying in our family to have food traditions that are simple enough that the kids can carry them on. Uh, one of them is, uh, we, every winter make a black walnut cake and this would be out of black walnuts that we harvest from our property here. We, we wild harvest, we haven't planted the trees and then we'll, we put them in the lane. We drive over them, (laughs) uh, as a way to crack them. And, uh, and then we'll, uh, We'll clean them all, all winter, sing around the woods, and finally have one small cake that we share as a family. Uh, just as one example, we grow our own dry beans too. And similarly, this is a family process where we can all take part. I mean, I would grow the plants and then harvest, and in the fall they dry down, and then we all we spread them out and stomp on them, and then winnow them. And uh, beans, to be honest, are a bit like carrots. It's hard to go back to the grocery store. <laughs> Uh, kind after you've grown your your own. They're just so juicy and the flavor is so full and rich in them. I've only done that a couple times. We grew black beans uh, a couple of years and it, uh, it really blew my mind of just uh, how satisfying it was, um, how yeah, again, juicier and kind of, I would say, oilier they are in a way that felt really healthy and, and how um, like filled with those anthocyanins, those kind of purple mm-hmm. and... Uh, uh, pigments that we know are really quite interesting for the gut and for health and mental health. So growing beans, uh, w- w- can you help us a little bit? Every, you know, a lot of folks listening, unfortunately, not yet after this, I hope you all consider it strongly, but they don't probably have a farm at their disposal. And I wonder if there are a couple of some of the plant forward food traditions in your family that, that might translate to folks who, you know, have got a farmer's market or a grocery store. Some of the things that you know, one of ours, uh, Ben, and everyone listening, is, is our lentil soup in the fall. I really look forward to it. Um, I wish it were with fresh lentils and lentils. that I planted lentils a few times. I haven't been successful. Uh, but uh, just love that soup, carrots, celery, onions, and lentils, a little salt and pepper, and, you know, and just a little olive oil in there, I guess, probably just makes. But are there some traditions, uh, some of your food traditions that you might share that, that, um, to inspire us? Well, we're in uh, late fall here, and so we're getting into late fall. And so one of the simplest things to do is take regional root crops um, and cut them into one-inch cubes. And we're talking butternut squashes or sweet potatoes, uh, in our case, and potatoes, uh, carrots we'll put in. Uh, and um, cut them in one-inch cubes, uh, or three-quarter-inch perhaps, and put them uh, in a tray on a pan uh, or roasting uh, dish and put it in the oven, 500 degrees Fahrenheit for about an hour. Uh, Drizzle plenty of oil, your favorite type of oil on top. And that's it. You know, salt and pepper, maybe some rosemary if you want. Um, But roasting those root vegetables is, um, we just have that almost (laughs) for several months here, uh, several days, several times a week. And it just gets us through the winter. And sweet potatoes, as you know, are, uh, extremely nutritious and thankfully delicious. The, that that oven roasted root vegetables, so some olive oil, rosemary, um, one of our favorites too, Ben. And I think uh, I, I throw those purple sweet potatoes on there, the purple Japanese sweet potatoes. Uh, since we've been talking about some interesting interesting turnip, turnip varietals, those all I find a really interesting add in that mix. 
Um, and I think it's a Some great- Some of our favorite food traditions, interestingly, don't involve cook, cooking. And we do, uh, Rachel especially, but we, um, does a lot of cooking. And But with um, just eating fresh food, I've talked about carrots and turnips. These are ones you just go out and eat. And I think if you're going to be a gardener, um, start there with the, with the uh, fresh, with the snacks. Grow some snacks. And one of our favorite snacks is one called Tokyo Bacana. Hmm. This is a Chinese cabbage, very fast to grow, um, and you can grow it all in all four seasons except midwinter around here. And it is a bit of a celery alternative. Okay, I talked about the importance of greens for the mineral content, the importance of fiber crops for the gut. But Tokyo Bacana is one that's a green and it's a high fiber crop. <laughs> and uh, it, it's a Chinese cabbage, so it's, it'll get sort of tall, 18 inches or so. Uh, but it is so juicy, uh, if you just pull off a stalk, it will um, make you crinkle your nose at celery. It's juicier than celery. It has that crisp taste. You can do your ants in a log thing, put peanut butter in it. You know, it's kind of cupped in the middle. So you ants in a log, put peanut butter and raisins on top uh, for the kids if you want. But to be honest, they'll just go out and grab those and just stick them in their mouth and uh, just uh, just love the sweetness of them, especially in the fall, start to turn into sugars. And um, that's been a favorite crop of ours. And I'll tell you, I know that this is a healthy crop, a superfood, because uh, what we do is when I'm done with these crops, I will use an occultation practice, which means put a, uh, a black tarp over top of a bed of crop. And so instead of tilling that crop in, we simply melt the crop in, in place. It's, com it's called com in situ composting. And within a week or two in the summer, that crop will be a pile of mush under a black tarp. And we have all those minerals that are left in the ground then for the next crop to go in. And it's a beautifully simple process too that doesn't involve owning a tiller or burning in gas. So that's a long-winded way of saying that once you pull the tarp off of Tokyo Bacana, what's left behind is what looks like corn uh, brooms. I don't know if you know what I mean, these old fashioned brooms. It looks like a bunch of heads of corn brooms all laying over. And what that is, is the fiber that's in that plant. And to just think about that fiber would have gone through our gut system as we eat, uh, you know, as we were eating uh, the plant. Uh, and to think about the one, the, what, how healthy that is. We got the minerals from the greens, but then uh, your gut got the benefit of all the fiber that Tokyo Bacana has. Everyone, this is one of my favorite moments in knowing farmers, and it just always has kept me inspired my whole life, is I think I know most of the foods. And then you meet a farmer, like we just met Ben, and we've heard about snacking turnips, we've heard about snacking cabbages, Tokyo Pecana, we've heard uh, about a number of uh, plants that probably most of us didn't have in our life. And I think it's one of those uh, wonderful, uh, just for me, constantly inspiring moments. Each time it happens, um, I, I'm kind of uh, refreshed in, in my hope and, and kind of desire, maybe a little bit of a quest as an eater to, you know, keep on eating, keep exploring, and that there's there's more stuff to learn about. It's, it's a very hopeful moment, I guess, for me. So th thank you for that, Ben. Um, and, and you were sharing some traditions, and it sounds like one of the ones that we should just note you're talking a lot about things that you do with your whole family and, and things that you do with your family in a community. And I think it's really important uh, to note those in a way that it sounds like you have a cultural tradition to, to sort of separate those out and support those. Because I think a lot of families, there's a lot of chaos where everything is kind of with other people, other, other families or at church or with sports teams. And there, there's not a lot of that... Um, kind of intimate, sweet, just the, you know, three or four or five of you kind of time for folks who have a family. Uh, and, and I think even if you're not in a traditional family structure, just having that time where it's a few of you to eat dinner, to crack walnuts, to clean beans, to read together, just a really important piece of mental fitness, you know, the, the kind of nuclear family or, uh, you know, kind of very inner small community building. And then that, that, you got a different mindset where uh, you're singing together or you're raising a barn together or you're eating together. So I appreciate you highlighting both of those. You know, we're, oh, uh, there's a new, uh, one of the newest words in the, the dictionary is one that I think might be relevant here. Um, but that what you're talking about is the idea that cult culture is not something on a grocery store shelf that you just go buy and, and pay money for and pick up. Culture is 
more of a verb. You do it. Uh, you create it. And so, and, and it needs to be constant. It's like growing food. It, it takes constant tending. Uh, Ken keeping is the word that I'm referring to, but it's, um, it's kind of been floating around our circles, but kin keeping is, would refer to creating culture or taking care of your kin. And I have an expansive view of that. It shouldn't just necessarily be people within your uh, genetic family uh, tree, uh, but it could be neighbors that just simply go up and say hi to a neighbor. Um, uh, some communities are putting in what's called chatty benches. I don't know if you've heard about these or not, but simply a bench in a park. And if you sit on that bench, there's a sign that says, Someone else is invited or may come up and sit with you and isn't welcome to talk to you. So it's a bench where the public is, where it's expected you're going to be chatty and say hi to a neighbor. And I think what a beautiful concept <laughs> because we've gotten to a point um, where it's almost expected in a public space that you're not going to be approached or that you wouldn't approach someone else and say hi. And so it's a way to uh, work at the loneliness ep epidemic <laughs> for one, uh, but it's a way of kin keeping and that expansive view of what kin keeping means. Well, I also wonder if you're speaking about some parts of the Midwest that get a little discounted. You know, we're often, wherever I go, people kind of spot me as a Midwesterner. I'm a little friendly, maybe, uh, if, I'm feel, if I'm feeling good. <laughs> want to say hi, want to, you know, uh, uh, comment on something with somebody. And, and I think there's something about that that helps uh, prevent some loneliness. You know, sometimes it's viewed as maybe just like a su superficial Midwestern thing. But I, I, I think over time, um, it's very meaningful uh, to be more engaging. It's that uh, tip I have often for patients when they're really down or struggling of uh, the littlest things, right? Ho ho saying hi to somebody, giving a friend a text. If there's somebody else struggling, reaching out, let them know you're thinking about them, holding the door for some, I mean, anything. There was a, I was in an elevator at a hotel the other day and a, a guy about my age got on and he had too many coffees this is a, you know, in his hand and he went to press the button and one of them spilled and it, it went all over him and I reached out and grabbed the cup and we, we had this little nice moment, I don't know, between the lobby and the third floor with a lot of spilled coffee in an elevator and two old guys saying, man, it's it kind of happens a lot more to me these days. Um, and those, those sorts of moments of connection are so important for all of us. Um, and I, and I, uh, Ben, I really appreciate you reminding of us them, uh, reminding us of them. Um, I want you to hold your book up again as our time's coming to a close, just so everybody watching can have a reminder where to learn more. This is Lean Micro Farm. Ben has his first book, Lean Farm. Uh, ben and, and his family, uh, his wife Rachel and their children uh, are on a small farm in Goshen, Indiana. And so if you're in that area and you're looking to taste some amazing farm fresh food, Ben, let's give a shout out to the, the restaurants that you all are supporting, just so if people want to eat your vegetables, so they don't all storm your farm. Where, where should people head to? What are the restaurants serving most of your food? Well, you can find our food in the Goshen Farmer's Market. You can find it at the uh, food co-op in town uh, called the Maple City Mar Market. And in uh, Goshen Brewing Company uh, would be another place you can find. There's a donut shop, Dutch Made Bakery, that serves our salad for lunch. So all over town, <laughs> you'll find it. You've got salad and a donut shop in Goshen, Indiana. You're doing something right, Ben. It's such an absolute treat to get to, to know you a little bit, to have you share some of your inspirations and some of your vegetable secrets and uh, especially uh, your very warm heart and to remind us all of our uh, duty. I really love the Buddhist philosophy you mentioned earlier of thinking how much you're giving and if you're not contributing to growing a community, then then maybe maybe you're you're pulling from that community. And sometimes we all need that. Mm -hmm. That's what community's for. Mm -hmm. But That's most of the time, unless we, you know we're really hurting, we want to be contributing in whatever we can to grow our communities. And it's such a, a wonderful message for us from a farmer, from somebody who really knows about that in the most uh, nu nu nutritious and nourishing and, and concrete way of really supporting communities with the food you grow. Uh, it's very personally meaningful for me to say hi to you and just to get to check in because uh, throughout the pandemic, as I was living on my farm, I thought about you all the time, uh, probably daily when I was in my garden, what would Ben Hartman do? <laughs> and so I, uh, I really uh, enjoy getting to share a little time with you. I'm, I'm sure we'll have you back on. Everybody check out the Lean Micro 
uh, farm because if you're growing stuff, it, you know, there aren't many people out there who sit and watch and meditate and think about the plants and how much nutrients they're pulling out of the soil and how they can simplify a system. And so Ben will help you grow more, grow better, and grow more interesting food for you, your family, and your community. Ben, I'm wondering if you have some final thoughts for us, just uh, for as people are heading out, maybe into their week or weekend, um, maybe some words of inspiration for us all. You have a lot of wonderful deep roots and a deeply philosophical world to, to help keep us inspired to make the right choices as, as eaters and as humans. I used to have a hat uh, that I wore until it was a threadbare, and it said, eat fruits and vegetables and be active. Uh, very simple message uh, that carried me for a long ways through some hard times. And I keep, uh, we keep a, a, a sign or a, a motto on the front door of our processing room uh, from the Tao Te Ching. It says, simplicity, patience, compassion. These are your greatest gifts. And so if we meditate on that before and after work, I find I at least am in a better place. Can you say this for, for us again, Ben, just uh, one more time? Simplic simplicity, patience, compassion. These are your greatest gifts. So take a minute and pause, meditate on that for 30 seconds before and after work. And uh, for me, it helps to, to center myself and give some purpose. Those are wonderful. Thank you for having me. I've, this has been a great conversation. Oh, Ben. It's and I hope we can stay in touch. Ben, we'll definitely stay in touch. It's such a treat to, to get an initial talk with you. I, it's really a dream of mine. Uh, 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 it, 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 I mean, it's on my bucket list if I have such a thing to, to uh, be on your farm with you. It's just such, to me, uh, uh, you know, a personal uh, farm psycho spiritual Mecca. And so I, I really look forward to that someday in Indiana and I wish you the very best in the fall season. Uh, one of the great things about your farm is so much activity, so much preparation, so much potential energy that you got going right away. And then it's just amazing to be speaking with you. We're late in the fall and just to see all that productivity, all that growth going behind you, uh, thank you, Ben, for all of you do and, and for all of the work and all the food that you grow and, and for sharing with us something around your stutter and, and all of the work that you've done to, to get to this moment and have just a, a wonderful, wonderful, fun, rolling conversation about all these things. We'll talk more about yeah. mental health and mental fitness. Everybody, please uh, take a moment take this conversation. Uh, we, we know that mental health awareness and mental fitness awareness matters if we actualize it. And to take some of these messages with you, I know that I'm going to go plant some spinach and tear out my tomatoes here as one action item for me. Uh, but I'm also going to sit with some of the very beautiful philosophical messages that Ben has left us with to think about as we think about more patience and compassion and simplicity in all of our lives as we seek to achieve greater mental fitness and mental health. Everyone, I'm Dr. Drew Ramsey. Thank you so much for your time and for your intention and your focus on improving your mental health and mental fitness. Nothing more is better for our communities and our world. I will see you in the next episode. And thanks so much. Please share this uh, with people you care about. Ben, I'll see you soon. Thanks so much. Okay, stay in touch.